Good morning and welcome uh, to the second of four webinars in ISAP's Ecosystem Market Summer Series. Um, for those who joined us on Tuesday, we're glad you're back. And for those <clears throat> who are joining us for the first time, we're glad you're here. And we're looking forward to today's conversation on innovative platforms that integrate farm data and access to ecosystem markets. My name is Jean Brokish, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. I am the Midwest Program Manager for American Farmland Trust, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Dr. Emily Bruner, the Midwest Science Director. And we're also joined behind the scenes by Beth Frazier, American Farmland Trust National Agricultural Land Network Manager. Uh, Beth is assisting us with technical support during today's webinar. A little bit about American Farmland Trust um, is a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to save the land that sustains us. Uh, so primarily by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and keeping farmers on the land. American Farmland Trust is a founding member of the Illinois Sustainable Ag Partnership, or ISAP which is a group of 13 organizations working together to improve soil health and reduce nutrient loss by, by really trying to encourage and accelerate the adoption of conservation practices. Our work in Illinois would not be possible without partnerships like this. And um, definitely would like to thank all the members of ISAP, but give special recognition to uh, groups, um, individual organizations that helped plan today's event, including the Illinois Corn Growers, Illinois Soybean Association, University of Illinois Extension, Agricultural Drainage Management Coalition, and the Nature Conservancy. And a special shout out to Megan Baskerville from the Nature Conservancy for her assistance. Uh, she's also helping behind the scenes today and as Megan is running our slide deck. Uh, this, this forum um, and this whole webinar series would not be possible without the collaboration and support from partner organizations from some nearby states. So we worked together with groups from Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin. And individuals from these organizations were critical to the success of our February webinar um, and their continued engagement and help to plan and promote our entire summer series is, is much appreciated. We also appreciate the fact that you've joined us. Nearly 500 people registered for today's webinar, including farmers, loan officers, agronomists, researchers, and a wide variety of professionals working in agriculture and conservation. And, and we're here, and, and we suspect you're here because we know there are lots of questions on ecosystem markets. So we've set aside the last half of the webinar for question and answer with our presenters today. <clears throat> And we encourage you to let us know what you want to know. You can use the question bar on your dashboard to ask questions that come to you at any time during today's webinar. And you can also use that question bar to alert staff of any tech issues you might be having. I also, of course, want to thank today's presenters who have worked with us to develop presentations that go beyond the the typical marketing pitch and address some of the questions we've been hearing from farmers and farm advisors. Today, we're joined by Amanda, Bog Amanda Bond Ziegler from Truterra, Kurt Alice uh, from Gradable by Farmers Business Network, and Steve Lemichau by with SIBO. Um, I'll provide more information on each of today's presenters, but first I'm going to pass it over to Emily to help set the stage. Great, thank you, Jean, uh, and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. I'd like to briefly introduce ISAP's vision for this webinar series, highlighting our three major objectives. The first being just to engage farmers, ag retailers, and advisors, and other professionals in the exploration of new uh, ecosystem market opportunities, provide transparent and accessible presentation of market incentives, and then increase confidence among farmers in evaluating these new programs. We'd also like to make it clear that we're not endorsing these programs or companies, nor are we promoting one opportunity over another. Uh, we merely just want to facilitate data sharing among our farmer networks and help folks make their own decisions about what may or may not be right for their farms. Next slide. 
So we've been overwhelmed with the level of interest and support that we've received in organizing these webinar series. We're also very grateful to our partners as well as the featured presenters for their time and effort behind the scenes to ensure that this webinar is as informative as possible. We employ three main strategies in building the content around these webinars involving curating questions from our networks in an attempt to anticipate some of the key questions that producers and ag professionals may have. Summarizing the responses from each presenting entity in a side by side comparison for quick reference and asking each presenter to walk us through a hypothetical farmer scenario to help demonstrate how each program offering and platform may differ in an accessible way. Next slide. So a fact sheet summarizing the platforms and programs featured during today's webinar can be downloaded from ISAP's website at the link provided on this slide. This link is also being sent through the chat feature. A recording of our previous webinars and the program summary tables developed for those events can also be found at this link as well. And the link will also be included in the follow-up email provided on Friday. Next slide. There are several tools and reports that are featured on the resource document we linked in the chat, and these can serve as a great starting point for anyone who's interested in digging deeper into quantifying outcomes of conservation practices. This isn't uh, intended to be an exhaustive or comprehensive list, but it's a great starting point with lots and lots of additional references to dig into. Additionally, we want to put on everyone's radar that we're working to compile all the responses and summary tables from this webinar series alongside with some key decision support criteria and important cons considerations in a succinct resource document. We're also developing slide decks uh, for sh shared use by our conservation partners. So I just want to encourage anyone interested in contributing to these efforts to please contact Jean or myself so we can be as inclusive as possible in sharing a common message around these opportunities and practices. Next slide. So to get a feel for some of these varying approaches, as we mentioned, we've asked today's presenters to walk us through a hypothetical farmer scenario as part of their presentations. The scenario farm we've asked these entities to walk us through was designed to be pretty typical for a Midwest corn soybean operation. We're assuming the farmer operates 1,000 acres, owning half and renting half. They typically run two tillage passes ahead of corn and no-till their soybeans. Three years ago, they began experimenting with cover crops on 80 acres, using the same field to try out an oat and radish mix before corn and cereal rye before their beans. They've continued with the implementing cover crops on those 80 acres, and now they're considering an ecosystem market and their future plans are listed on this slide. In 2021, they'll implement 420 additional acres of cover crops covering all of their owned acres. In 2022, they'll go to no-till corn on all 1,000 acres while continuing with cover crops on their own ground. And in 2023, they'll bring cover crops to their rented ground, so an additional 500 acres of cover crops. Next slide, please. So this is just another representation of this data in tabular form with the new cover practices highlighted in green and the new tillage practices highlighted in yellow. So we've asked these presenters to incorporate this scenario in their presentations and we're really excited to see how these different platforms and programs compare. Just noting that each presenter will get about 12 minutes and we'll save the Q&A for the last half of the webinar. So let's get started. Back to you, Jean. Thanks, Emily. Uh, appreciate that uh, introduction and getting us off on the on the right page or the same page together. Um, our first speaker today is Amanda Bonziegler. She is an account manager at Trutera, the sustainability business of Landro Lakes. Amanda lives in North Central Ohio and serves Trutera retailers in a territory that includes Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and the Northeast. And she has been a leader in representing the new True Carbon program since its launch in January 2021. Before jo joining Trutera, Amanda spent seven years with Winfield United in Ohio, where she represented a product portfolio including ag technology, seed, and plant nutrition. 
and she has a bachelor's degree in agricultural studies from the same university as I attended. So that was a fun connection that Amanda and I discovered. We both are graduates of the University of Wisconsin at River Falls. So thank you, Amanda, for joining us today. Thanks, Jean. So jumping right in, I just wanted to start by telling a little bit about Truterra and who we are. So we are part of Land Lakes, which makes us a farmer owned, retailer driven, sustainability focused platform. And we've been working on farm um, stewardship and conservation since before 2016. So this is not a new arena for us. Next. We do have Truterra retailers, and I just want to highlight that retailers are able to offer. Um, there's a little bit of echo on my end. So these I retailers. Heard, I heard sorry. it as well, but it's maybe continue and see if it continues. Okay. So these retailers are able to offer a lot more to their farmers than just a carbon program. And today we're going to focus on carbon, but I want you to know that these retailers service this area and they can provide a lot more when it comes to stewardship and conservation than just a carbon program. Next. So moving into true carbon, our focus here, because we are farmer owned and retailer driven, we really tried to build a program with a lot of flexibility built in that was easy for farmers and retailers to participate in. So I'm going to show you a little bit of what that journey looked like from a farmer's perspective. Next. So this is the nuts and bolts of our program. And on the top of my slides, you'll see our February 2021 offer is listed. So what I'm going to show you today is the offer we had launched in February and that we're wrapping up kind of as we speak. Our next offer will look slightly different. So all the details today are based on what our previous offer looked like. So the nuts and bolts are that we're paying $20 per ton, fully in an upfront payment this year for historical practices with no extra fees for the farmer. Um, the buyer that we have, they wanted these credits delivered in June. So we were able to look at historical practices only in this initial offer and reward farmers for what they've already done. And as far as fees, Truterra is covering all sampling and other fees associated with the offer. So farmers really had no cost to participate. Next. When it comes to what was eligible, so for our offer, you did have to implement a new practice within the past five years. And you can see some optional practices listed here. We did have to have corn, soybeans, wheat, or cotton in the rotation of the field. So the field could be a different crop today, but these four crops had to be part of the rotation, one of the four crops. We could accept rented or owned acres. If it was a rented acre, the farmer or the person marketing the credit just had to have an attestation signed by the landowner saying that they had the right to market these. For the seasons that we were buying credits for, so the past five years, that field could not have been under contract with another carbon buyer. And there was no minimum or maximum acreage to enroll. The farmer got to control how much of their farm they wanted to participate with. Next. A couple of other important details about our program is that we did use a prioritization process to choose the fields that we contracted on. So we had a certain number of tons we were looking for. We had a buyer for all of the tons we were going to transact. And so we prioritized the fields that were enrolled in our program and then contracted on those highest opportunity fields. The farmer maintains control of all their future credits. We're buying historical credits only. We hope the farmer wants to continue to sell to us in the future, but you could participate in this first offer and then in the future sell to another program if you wanted to. And farmers could choose to work directly with Truterra to facilitate this offer, or if they were more comfortable working with their local Truterra retailer, they could do it through them too. And we managed time as we went along the offer, and I hope you'll see that in my next slides. Um, there was very little time spent by the farmer to figure out even if they were a good candidate. We did not collect the full data set on every field that was enrolled. We kind of managed time along the way as the farmer was able to see their opportunity. Next. So how did that offer end up? Um, we ended up in a 30 day sign up period. We had about 1,245 farmers indicate interest in our program. We were able to reach our target of 100,000 metric tons and then some from that farmer pool. And for those farmers that did remove the contracted tons of carbon, they will be getting payments that total about two and a half million dollars that we'll be able to return to those farmers for things they've already done on their farm. Next. So moving into the farmer scenario, 
only these 80 acres of cover crops from 2018 would have qualified for our offer because we were historical looking only in this initial February offer. So those acres would have had three years of practice change. Next. And as we move through this example, <clears throat> so they did transition 80 acres to a new practice within the past five years. So they do qualify for the program. For data, this farmer would need to supply three years of data for the 18, 19, and 20 season, plus three years of data prior to that to establish their baseline. So there'd be a total of six years of farm data collected for this farmer. And on the right hand side, you can see how the payment would work out. <clears throat> the estimated payment for these 80 acres would be between $960 to $2,400, and that would get paid in full this summer. Next. So this is kind of what the farmer journey looked like. We launched our first survey in January of 2021. So there was a 30 second survey that a farmer took to determine whether or not they're a good candidate. If they were a good candidate, we invited them to our onboarding website where they could either do it themselves or work with their retailer to collect a little bit more information. Once they onboarded, we actually sent them an estimated offer based on the information they provided. Um, and then at that point, the farmer could say, yeah, this is worth my time or maybe not this year. If they wanted to participate, we moved on to full data collection, which again, they could work with us or their local retailer to complete. And then Truterra handled the soil sampling, quantification and third party verification steps. After all of that was done, we went back to the farmer with a hard offer. Um, and again, they could opt in the fields that they wanted to, or if there were some that didn't work out the way they thought it would, they could opt those out. And then finally, we'll land at the payment tile um, in August or September of this year. Next. So I just wanna show you what each of those steps look like. Again, initially this first step is just a very simple five question survey about your whole farm and what practices you've adopted recently. So in 30 seconds, you can find out, am I really a candidate for this or not? Next. If you are a good candidate, we invite you to onboarding. And what that means is you just provide us your field boundaries for the fields you wanna participate on and a brief cropping history for the last five or six years. Next. Once we have that brief cropping history, we're able to estimate an offer. So for the fields that still look like good qualifiers, we sent you an offer saying, here's what we anticipate your payment might look like. And that gives the farmer an opportunity to say, it's worth my time to keep moving through this, or I think I'm gonna opt out at this point. Next. If a farmer said, this is worth my time, we moved into full data collection and sampling. So Truterra took care of sampling. And then when it came to full data collection, there were options. If farmers really liked doing it themselves, we would send them spreadsheets, they could send us notes, we would do phone interviews, or if they wanted to work through that local retailer, that was an option again. So we tried to be very flexible when it came to how the data gets collected and the different, different avenues a farmer could take. Next. And then finally, we are sending a final offer um, on a field by field basis. So when a farmer gets their final offer from us, they can see each season that we're purchasing the credit for, for that field the tonnage that we totaled up for each season, as well as what that payment looks like. And then again, on a field by field basis, they could opt in or opt out. And once they're done opting in fields, we send them a contract, and then hopefully in another month or two here, we start paying them. Next. So just a few differentiators. First of all, we're buying the actual carbon credit and not maintaining rights to any of your future credits. So a farmer has control of what they choose to enroll and what the future looks like in terms of who they want to transact carbon with. Um, we're also partnering with retailers. Some farmers want to have a local contact that they're familiar with, those people that know their farm, um, and we're providing that option in our program. We're paying on practices that have already occurred, so we're just asking people to keep farming the way they've been farming and reward them for it. And then finally, we feel we've provided a lot of flexibility, transparency, and control for the farmer as they move through this carbon market with True Carbon. Next. So when is our next offer coming? We will have an offer for 2022. 
and we're not done building it. We're honestly taking a lot of feedback right now and kind of building our next offer. So in October, we hope to have a little bit more information to share about what it will look like. And in December or January, we will open enrollment again for farmers that wanna participate or at least look at our program. We can expect that it will look a little different. We hope to provide both a look back and a forward looking offer for the next um, tranche. And then we're going to work on adding efficiencies for data entry and data collection processes as well. Next. And finally, for anyone that's interested in learning about our program as soon as the details are available, you can go to this um, carbon survey website and take that 30 second survey. Just tell us a little bit of information about your farm and what you've been up to. And then as soon as our next offer is available, you'll be the first on the list to get some information about it and know if you're a good candidate or not. And we have the slogan, when in doubt, fill it out. So even if you're not sure that this will be the program for you, um, it's only 30 seconds. It's very quick to fill out. It doesn't require a lot of information and it will let you know if it's a good option or not. And that's the end, thank you. I like that, when in doubt, fill it out. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda, um, for your information there on Chutera's program. Um, next presenter today is Kurt Alice, the Strategy and Operation Manager for Farmers Business Network Sustainability Arm, known as Gradable, a Venture for America Fellow and graduate of Middlebury College's Environmental Studies program. Kurt has spent his career growing startups in agriculture technology and he currently leads Gradable Carbon, which facilitates carbon credit production for FBN farmers and also builds supply chain programs that reward farmers for conservation and environmental practices. So appreciate you uh, joining us today, Kurt, and I will um, let you share information with us. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Jean. Um, thank you to, to Jean and Emily um, and the American Farmland Trust and ISAP for for putting together this series. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of programs, a lot of carbon programs that exist in the market today. Um, and I think it's great that there's an educational series geared towards uh, farmers in the ag community um, to, to highlight the differences um, in, the, in these programs um, and uh, provide more clarity uh, to the landscape. And thank you to, to Amanda and uh, Steve for being willing to uh, present uh, side by side here. Um, so yeah, my name is Kurt Alice, um, and I'm the uh, program lead for uh, the Gradable Carbon Program. Uh, Gradable, as Gene said, is the sustainability arm of uh, FBN. Uh, next. So just a quick background uh, on FBN. Farmers Business Network was started uh, in 2014. Uh, we have uh, 25,000 growers now that participate in our network across uh, the United States, Canada, uh, and uh, recently we, we launched in Australia. Um, farmers come to FBN for data analytics services, for network data, um, being able to share information anonymously and see what other growers uh, in the network are doing. Um, we have also launched uh, an inputs business farm, uh, FBN Direct, uh, which sells uh, inputs directly to the farm gate, um, which can be transacted online. Um, we also have FBN Financial, which is crop marketing and financial services uh, for farms. Um, and then, uh, you know, amongst our other offerings, uh, Gradable, uh, as I mentioned, is the sustainability arm of FBN um, with the mission to really connect farmers to buyers of ecosystem services, uh, whether it's uh, carbon offsets, as we're talking about today, um, or attributes of grain specifically. Um, so, you know, we are working with our growers uh, to find an increasing, an increasing number of opportunities uh, for farmers to be rewarded for sustainable practices. Next. And so uh, before I get into the details uh, of our carbon program, um, I just wanna um, highlight just a few other examples of opportunities uh, in uh, the ecosystem services space uh, opportunities for farmers to be rewarded uh, for practices. Uh, today we're talking about private private voluntary markets uh, for carbon credits, um, but there's also uh, insets markets for scope three emissions, being able to sell attributes of grain into the supply chain. Um, farmers should keep their eye on uh, the federal carbon bank and opportunities um, for uh, 
you know, the, the government to ask, act as a buyer uh, for uh, carbon credits. Um, you know, policy there um, could, you know, will uh, drastically impact um, this space. Um, and there's a lot happening right now um, uh, with the new administration. And then also um, other markets like low carbon fuel markets, um, being able to capture the carbon intensity of your grain and flow that information um, up into uh, biofuel production. Um, so, you know, carbon offsets uh, is obviously the focus of today, but there's a lot of opportunities um, to be rewarded for the same practices that are rewarded in an offsets market um, elsewhere. Uh, this is a very exciting landscape and there's a lot happening. Uh, so keep an eye out. Next. And just to, just to show uh, kind of the difference here between uh, insets and offsets, uh, what these two terms mean, um, and also just highlight uh, what really needs to happen on a farm level here uh, for these systems to work. Um, you know, first of all, starting on the left-hand side here, you know, and, and uh, Amanda mentioned this in terms of, you know, uh, the local resources uh, that a farmer has uh, to help uh, with, these, with these practices. Um, you know, this, this takes a village for farmers to uh, adopt these things um, and for, for conservation to move forward. So we're talking about markets today, but, you know, inputs are really important here, financing programs, uh, flow of information through analytics, um, all of these things have to come together uh, for these programs to scale um, and for, uh, you know, farmers to be able to take advantage of them. Um, also, just illustrating on the right-hand side, the difference between insets and offsets. Here we're talking about, you know, uh, getting credit for practices removed from the supply chain um, on the bottom uh, with carbon offsets, but also, uh, you know, these, these same attributes uh, that you're getting credits for can also flow up through the supply chain uh, to grain buyers um, and to eventually to end users in the market. Um, so farmers should think creatively and keep an eye on, on all the markets that exist um, out there today so they can figure out what's, what's the best value and opportunity for, for their individual farm. Next. And before I get into uh, the carbon offset program um, that we've launched, um, here's just a few examples of, of inset programs um, that FBN and Gradable are running today. Uh, we have uh, partnerships with Unilever, Poet, and Tyson across food, feed, fuel, and feed. Uh, these are a combination of um, scope three inset programs, um, as well as uh, mass balance um, and research pilots um, that are helping these organizations understand how they can actually incorporate these emissions reductions um, and sequestered carbon uh, into their supply chains in the future. So again, just a lot happening in this space, a lot of opportunities. Next. But now I'm going to jump into the details uh, of our gradable carbon offset program. Um, you know, uh, to learn more about the program, go to gradable.com forward slash carbon. There's more information there. Um, and farmers can sign up to talk to one of our sustainability program leads um, who can tell you more about the program, um, take you through uh, an eligibility survey um, and see if, if, if you can participate, uh, if you meet the requirements of the program um, and what opportunities could look like. Next. So uh, when we launched our program, uh, which was launched uh, also in, in February of this year, uh, we saw uh, the carbon markets that exist in the landscape today. We went to our growers um, and uh, we came up with the, the following program mission. Uh, we wanna offer farmers the flexibility to earn credits with practices that work best on their farm and the freedom to bank and retain the upside of an expanding carbon market. And I'll get into a little bit about what that means uh, later in this presentation. Next. So how do you earn um, credits? Uh, farmers in our program can earn credits on two years of historical practices and then on uh, practices adopted moving forward. Uh, this is across uh, reduced tillage, switching to minimal till or no-till, um, introducing or expanding the use of cover crops, um, improving nitrogen efficiency, and then not listed here, also uh, expansion of biodiversity uh, in, the, in the crop rotation. Um, and Estimates, and again, this is going to be on a field by field level, um, but are that you can generate 0 0.1 to 0.25 and, and 1.5 credits per acre per year um, in our program, depending on the combination of practices, your specific land, soil type, climate, um, a lot of levers uh, that impact your credit potential, uh, which you can learn more about um, through enrolling in our program. Next. 
Great. So how do you generate credits? Um, you know, this is going to be pretty similar across programs, um, but uh, you enroll fields um, in, uh, in through FBN. Um, you know, our analytics platform is set up to absorb uh, fields. Uh, you should securely share practices um, with FBN. Um, all of this information um, is uh, anonymized and aggregated. Um, so the practices uh, are used to generate your credits, um, but those practices are not specifically shared uh, with any other organizations um, outside of uh, the verification process. Um, Gradable then covers the cost of sampling um, to establish uh, the baseline in the first year. We've been busy sampling um, this spring. Um, and then, you know, our program is a, a five-year contract. Um, and so through the program, um, you submit annual field records um, to continue to participate, again, through that FBN uh, data ingestion platform. Um, and then when you actually uh, uh, have all of your practices in place, um, you earn carbon credits uh, for uh, the practices I talked about on the previous slide. Um, and these are all verified by a third party, which is again, paid for uh, by Gradable. And then going back to you know, something that's different about our program, um, when you sign up for our program, um, you can either uh, earn $20 a credit for historical practices, or you can hold your credits um, and bank them for the future. Um, that exposes farmers to the upside uh, in these markets um, and allows uh, farmers to uh, take advantage of uh, any potential growth in this space um, and new opportunities uh, for them to sell their credits. Next slide. So uh, how is Gradable Carbon different against the other programs that are gonna be presenting today? Again, we wanna make this as flexible for your farm as possible within the constraints uh, of our registry and protocol. Um, and then really, you know, the centerpiece, which I've talked about, the freedom to sell credits, um, to hold on to credits uh, if the market expands um, and sell uh, into a market uh, that works best for the farmer. As a part of that um, is really, uh, you know, fundamental, idea of transparency here. So when you are deciding whether you wanna sell your credits or not, you're seeing directly what the market is paying for those credits. You're seeing what the buyer is actually purchasing those credits for. So rather than us uh, purchasing the credits and then selling them for a different amount, um, the, the farmer has transparency um, and information about where this market is. Uh, what is the pricing looking like? What are these credits selling for? Um, which just uh, brings the farmer uh, into uh, the economy of this market, which is great. And then something I haven't mentioned, but um, ties into uh, one of my early slides. We also offer a gradable plan uh, agronomy service, um, which combines uh, you know, grid soil sampling, uh, variable rate application prescriptions, um, and assistance with practice adoption. Um, so farms can think about, you know, what are the ROI of these practices? Um, I wanna balance you know, participation in these programs. Um, thinking about, you know, what practices are going to work for my operation um, while also, uh, you know, running, running a business and continuing to um, operate uh, the way you have uh, in the past. Next. Great. So jumping into the, the farmer scenario here. Uh, next. Um, so. Uh, a few pieces uh, to, to look at uh, with the historical information. Um, first, uh, rented and owned acres are both eligible to participate in our program today, so no uh, clear difference between uh, those two columns. Um, as I mentioned, two years of historical practice adoption uh, is eligible for credit generation um, in our program. Um, and this is, this is actually a pretty interesting scenario, uh, given uh, the rules of our protocol. So we would not be able to credit for practices adopted in 2018. Uh, that would be a part of the baseline uh, that we would be working off of uh, to demonstrate additionality. So since oats and radishes were adopted on those 80 acres, um, we would not be able to credit for those um, because it was in 2018. Um, but because the farmer is now incorporating cereal rye on those same 80 acres, um, that actually could check the box for uh, improved biodiversity, bringing another crop into the rotation. But 
But because the farmer does not plan to continue to plant oats and radishes and cereal rye, um, for, for this case, I'm going to say that they would be not eligible uh, to generate credits for the cereal rye on those 80 acres. Next. And just to uh, get into kind of the operations of the, of the, the project, um, we would actually split out those 80 acres from the rest of uh, the planted ground here. Um, farmers enroll in our program on a field by field level. Um, so those 80 acres would be removed and that enables uh, farmers to generate credits on the other fields in the program. Next. So uh, on the, on the left-hand side here, a reduced tillage for corn, uncovered cropping ahead of soybeans uh, would be eligible uh, for credit generation in 2022 and 2023 on all 500 acres. Um, for the 2021 um, cereal rye expansion, uh, all 420 acres of that would be eligible for credit generation and only those 80 acres uh, would be ineligible because of historical adoption. And lastly, um, reduced tillage for corn, I would also be eligible uh, for, for credit generation on all 500 acres in 2022. So I went a little over in time, sorry about that, Gene, um, but uh, that's all I have today. Next slide. Again, if you, uh, if you wanna learn more about uh, the Gradable Carbon Program, uh, go to gradable.com forward slash carbon um, and look forward to the Q&A. Hey, thanks, Kurt. And uh, a nice job kind of teasing out the nuances of our hypothetical farmer scenario there. Um, it's a little, lots of moving parts there. So I appreciate the information. Um, and I will uh, introduce our third presenter today. Um, Steve Lemeschow is the Director of Carbon, uh, at Pro Director of Carbon Product at SIBO, where he's responsible for driving product development and commercialization efforts for SIBO Carbon. Uh, prior to joining SIBO, Steve spent over eight years at Google, where he led strategic partnerships and sustainability for Waze Carpool. Uh, he has extensive experience developing marketplaces, managing partnerships, and building tools. And I appreciate uh, Steve's willingness to be with us this morning and share information. Thanks, Steve. Sure. Thanks, Gene. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, let's go to the first slide. <clears throat> So uh, Cebo Technologies is a software uh, and technology company. We were founded originally by Flagship Pioneering in 2015. Um, our goal uh, is really to apply uh, you know, advanced science and technology to create a deeper understanding of land and agricultural systems. Uh, we are a small but mighty team of about 40 people split primarily between Minneapolis, Minnesota and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, you know, we're heavily science and engineering focused um, with the majority of our team uh, with PhDs and, and crop scientists and, and, and data scientists. Next slide, please. So, you know, SIBO's focus is really on scaling regenerative agricultures in support of growers. Uh, and so, I think you know in order for these uh, changes to be made we really are we're going to have to ask growers to make uh, changes in the way that they grow food um, and you know for decades uh, even you know, 100 years we've been sort of really promoting a, a few different things which is about efficiency uh, you know pulling more yield out of acreage uh, each and every year and at what cost i mean this has had impacts on uh, land quality you know we've been degrading land for for many years with environmental impacts and you know in order for us to make a big change we're going Going to need to support growers uh, in you know things like reduced tillage and reduced chemical use and cover crop addition, uh, as well as uh, you know promoting crop diversity. Um, and ultimately, in order for us to accomplish that, we're going to need to help uh, uh, sponsor some of these practices. Let's go to the next slide. So SIBO has uh, many different ways of, of, of doing this. And I think, you know, we're developing several different solutions, but one of the most obvious and exciting is about carbon markets. Um, you know, carbon markets are a really interesting and practical opportunity to allow the private sector to participate in the sponsorship of these practices. Uh, and, you know, on the one side, they're reducing their own greenhouse gas footprints, but they're doing so in a way that allows growers to adopt these practices um, and sponsor them uh, and ultimately to, to have an, an additional revenue stream to do so. And so, you know, SIBO's process is very simple. Um, growers enroll in SIBO's marketplace, and I have a few screenshots uh, later to show you what that looks like. It's a UI-based approach 
that's very simple and streamlined. Uh, SIBO then monitors and verifies these practices using a combination of remote sensing, uh, as well as, you know, sort of attestation on an annual basis by working directly with the growers. Uh, SIBO then feeds this information through our model, the SALIS model, uh, which, we, which we use to quantify uh, carbon impact. We then uh, work with a third party to take soil samples, uh, validate, and then register these credits. We're working with uh, Vera, which is a, a registry that some of you may have heard of, um, as well as an, our own internal carbon market. Um, and that lists then credits for sale. Once these credits sell, grower gets paid. So it's this value cycle that allows us to help support growers um, in you know, their, their transition to renewable or re, uh, regenerative. Let's go to the next slide, please. So SIBO is, is leveraging a huge amount of data um, to you know, sort of run our, our, the SALIS model. Really, we spent the first few years of our company's existence uh, taking this model and scaling it. This allows us to run it at an individual field level um, instantaneously, as well as all the way up to regional or even national levels. Um, and so you know, we're using this system in support of the software that we're building on top of it. So we've so far launched three software solutions that kind of operate in tandem um, to unlock the power of the science that we're generating underneath. So SIBO Enterprise, SIBO Carbon, and SIBO Insights are all designed to unlock uh, uh, the value of our science on behalf of growers, as well as you know, all the way to the end consumer. Next slide, please. So, you know, as we've been developing our carbon market, there's four primary tenants that we're looking to build into it. The first is accessibility. Uh, you know, certification requirements must be designed with all farmers in mind, not just massive landowners. And so, you know, we're designing a process that, that really does encapsulate, you know, both the big landowners as well as individuals who are renting their land at a much smaller scale. We have no limits to the size of growers that are allowed to participate, uh, but we realize that in order for these practices to be adopted wholesale, a across the entire country, we need to make sure that, that we limit barriers as much as possible. The second is recognition. You know, there are growers that are already doing these practices, uh, and these folks are trailblazers and should be rewarded for not just adopting them in the past, but also warehousing carbon in their soil moving forward. Um, so, you know, we, we want to build a program that is uh, uh, valuing those who are adopting practices for the first time, as well as those that have already adopted them in the past, even 10 years ago. The third is flexibility. You know, agricultural decisions are made on an annual basis. Um, you know, it's really difficult to have a grower uh, commit to a practice, uh, doing the same practices, you know, for 10 or 20 years. Uh, you know, we believe that there should be uh, annual commitments in which growers agree to make a, uh, do these practices that year. Uh, and there should then be enough uh, sort of uh, nimbleness to the credits that allow us to say, if there's a turnover in operation, that an, a cre a, a, an individual field of land would be eligible to be taken over by someone else. And then finally, equity. Um, you know, historically, carbon prices within um, you know agriculture have been between ten and twenty dollars. Um, but at this point, that is not enough to cover the full cost of these practices. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, evidence to suggest that growers are, are are requiring you know somewhere between you know fifty and hundred dollars to actually adopt no-till and cover crop on an acre of land. So even if a hundred percent of what the buyer is paying is ending up in a grower's pocket, that's still not enough to incentivize a huge portion of, of growers out there. So we really do believe that the price of carbon needs to go up if we really want to see um, you know, the full-scale adoption of these practices. The other piece here is that you know, aside from carbon credits, there need to be stacked incentives, other ways of incentivizing these behaviors. Uh, and I know Kurt alluded to this earlier, that involves other things like insetting um, and even potentially uh, you know, incentivizing just the adoption of practices beyond you know, what's associated with the greenhouse gas uh, measurement piece. Next slide, please. So SIBO has uh, an offering that is designed to do a few things. Uh, one, you know, we want to try and, and, and appeal to as many different types of buyers out there. So that could include, you know, large corporations who are looking to purchase offsets, as well as corporations uh, or, or, you know, entities that have a footprint within agriculture uh, and might be interested in, in managing their own scope three emissions through something called an inset. Um, you know, and simultaneously, we need solutions that apply to as many growers as possible. So, you know, Vera's carbon uh, offsets or VCUs um, are what SIBO is using to, to, for our offset program. 
you know, these are a very high standard of, of offsets. The requirements related to additionality and permanence um, make it challenging to generate these credits and ultimately it limits the number of growers that are eligible to participate. Those that are, who are able to adopt a new practice for the first time, um, will be eligible for a large credit and, and one that is very, very likely to sell. Um, you know, our baseline requires, uh, as you know, was with the case with the previous programs, uh, three years of data prior to the management change. Um, you know, the requirements would include things like reduced tillage, cover crop adoption, uh, and reduced nitrogen. And, you know, there is a, a, a common practice threshold for VERA that makes it a little bit difficult um, to participate. That's about 20% um, within a particular strata. Uh, and the grower commitment in our case is between one and 10 years. Um, you know, again, we wanna make it as flexible as we can uh, in order to include as many growers as possible. And pricing for this particular credit is gonna be high at $50 a credit because of their scarcity and high quality. The second type of sort of vehicle that we've created is called the SIBO Emissions Reduction Unit. This is an internal program to SIBO, and it's designed specifically for insetting. Um, insetting, again, is, is related to scope three emissions. That's something that's part of, uh, you know, an entity's own um, supply chain. And so, you know, this is a more inclusive vehicle. In other words, you know, we're able to include growers that have adopted practices in the past, and our baseline in this case is a little bit different. We're doing a baseline that is based on typical regional practices um, you know, as well as the grower's own crop rotation so that we can, you know, include growers who have adopted practices in the past, but compare to, you know, what typical practices might look like in a given region. The practice uh, eligibility is going to be the same for this, um, but we're also able to include up to 50%, um, you know, from a, a common practice threshold perspective, and we're looking for annual commitments here. Uh, and then finally, with custom incentives, you know, we really believe that there are other opportunities to incentivize growers beyond just greenhouse gases. Um, so, you know, be through our SALIS model, we're able to quantify exactly what the, the you know, GHG impact will look like, uh, but ultimately we want to be able to provide other mechanisms to, for, for other entities to support them. Um, and so, you know, you could imagine uh, uh, you know, certification of land or certification of yield coming off of land, um, as well as, you know, other types of incentive programs that might uh, result from, you know, discounted product offerings. Our platform, our platform is flexible uh, in a sense that we're able to facilitate any different type of incentive um, available. Let's go to the next slide. So to talk a little bit more about the, the example uh, of the two different types of farms, you know, I think at a high level, both all of the acreage would be eligible for one or the other type of, um, of, of carbon credit that we've established. Um, you know, in the case of the uh, uh, rented land, you know, our emissions reduction unit would allow for all of the acreage to qualify. Um, for Vera's carbons unit, uh, for, for uh, Vera's VCU, all of the acres would technically qualify um, as that, you know, you're adopting a new practice for the first time, but there would be a, likely a preference for growers that can make a longer term commitment in this case. We're only dealing with a single practice adoption in, uh, uh, for this new year. Um, and given, you know, that only, you know, a, a, a singular practice would generate sort of a, a, a smaller credit. Typically, what we like to see is multiple practices being adopted at the same time so that, you know, the, cre the, the credit is as large as possible. Um, so the combination of a single practice and an annual commitment would likely yield a smaller payment, which would make it difficult uh, to enroll in various carbon program. Uh, we still can do that, um, but it's a, a little bit more challenging. Now, for the owned land, you know, all again, all acreage uh, would qualify for uh, emissions reduction unit. And then for Vera, the original 80 acres uh, would not qualify because it's a new uh, practice adoption. Um, however, the conversion to no-till on those 80 acres would apply. Uh, and then the remaining 420 acres uh, would qualify for both the uh, uh, cover crop adoption and no-till. Next slide, please. So uh, these are just sort of a walkthrough of what it would look like from an uh, emissions reduction unit perspective uh, to enroll in our program. Next slide. So this is our land manager view um, where, you know, organizations or enterprises or individual growers can see uh, all of the different fields uh, that are under their purview. So in this case, you can see on the bottom, we have uh, the owned land and rented land. Um, and you'll see that the, the size of the acreage here is 159 in both cases. They're the same, but less than the 500 acre uh, example that was stated earlier. So um, just something to call out. Uh, next slide. 
So if you hit the uh, enroll button up top, it's going to pull up uh, the owned and rented acreage into this uh, uh, UI. Um, so you'd identify the year that you're um, enrolling and then you create a title. Next slide, hit enroll. And now it's going to ask us to, to add management practices for the rented land. Um, so this is a very simple approach. Um, you know, we don't need to collect a ton of information up front. Uh, you know, you identify what you grew last year, corn, and this year we're doing soy. Uh, we did not do a cover crop in the field and we're doing no-till. And then you hit save practice and go next. And then we have the owned uh, uh, field, and we're, you know, in this case, we are, we did do a cover crop on 100% of the land um, and no till. Next slide. And then instantaneously, our Salus model is run on that specific acreage uh, with those management practices. So you can see that, you know, the individual, uh, the, the rented land. Um, is a little bit less from a credit perspective because there was only one new practice. Uh, so it's really, it's accepting this data um, in real time to estimate exactly how many credits you could uh, generate on a per acre basis. Next slide. And then lastly, uh, you'll enter a little bit of information about you uh, as well as your organiza organization and indicate whether or not you're adopting these practices for the first time. If you hit yes to that, then we'll be able to follow up with you with additional information about VERA. Uh, VERA does require uh, more attestation about past practices so we can establish a uh, three-year baseline. Next slide. I think that's pretty much it. This is just a view of the status of your carbon credits. Thanks, Steve. Um... Yeah, we will um, we'll have to save kind of using that hypothetical farmer and how that fits into your, your platform for another time. I'm switching over to just some uh, question and answer time. Um, appreciate the information, Steve, and I appreciate all of the presenters um, and the, the information they shared with us. And uh, it's been some good questions coming in through the Q&A function. Uh, so we're going to reuse the rest of today's time to really try to tackle as many as possible kind of uh, put put them into different buckets and run through some of the common questions. Um, so just invite the presenters to all turn their cameras and mics on. And while they do that, I'm going to just share a few quick ground rules here just to make sure that we have opportunity for everyone to respond and share information. Um, so so I'll, I'll pose a question and then each presenter will have a minute to respond to the question. Um, asking you all to just keep it succinct. Um, try to keep the responses under one minute. Um, if you if you do go on and on and on, I'll I'll interject and and uh, encourage you to wrap up and go to the next uh, next presenter and we'll um, rotate through the same order as you presented. So we have Amanda, Kurt, and then Steve um, in that order, and then we'll um, rotate in who goes first as we go through the different questions too. So our first question uh, goes to Amanda and. Um, you know, um, I guess to preface that first for the audience is to just say that we do have a program matrix that we've developed for today's sessions that really kind of recaps a lot of the basic information about um, each of these programs and platforms. So encourage you all to refer to that and you can download that after the webinar if you want to uh, keep it and have it for future reference. But, you know, each of you, one of the most common questions is like farmers who've been doing this for a long time. And so it's really great. All of you indicated some sort of market opportunity for practices that have been adopted in the past, which is great news for a lot of farmers out there. Um, just wondering, starting with Amanda again, can you recap for us what those options are and provide info on how you're verifying the carbon credit generated from this historical practices? Sure. So in our initial program, the one that launched in February, uh, we did have a five-year look-back period. So we were able to reward farmers for practices they adopted up to five years ago. And in our future programs, we hope to have a look-back, whether it'll be five years, I'm not sure yet, but a look-back and a look-forward offer. As far as how we're quantifying and verifying carbon, we are using a combination of soil sampling, carbon modeling and a pretty intense data set that the farmer is providing about what has happened on their farm. So just their their own farm management data is a piece of it. Great. Um, Kurt? 
Yeah, so uh, we have a two year uh, look back, as I said in my presentation, but I just wanna say that this, this is, um, you know, uh, something that needs to be addressed at a high level. I think that uh, all project developers in this space right now know that um, farmers that have been doing these practices historically um, need to be rewarded for that. How that actually looks uh, with, you know, a greater look back, you know, looking at, you know, some of the farmers that have adopted these things, you know, a decade ago and have really paved the way, um, you know, working with a lot of the consortiums, uh, which a lot of the, the project developers are a part of, um, there's a lot of creative solutions right now uh, that are coming out. How exactly it's gonna look um, and how those uh, individuals are gonna be rewarded uh, is, is still in development. Um, and we should all remember that this is the first year that carbon credits have been generated across all programs uh, for farms. So we're early stage here, um, but uh, we definitely know that these farmers need to be included and we're trying to come up with creative solutions to do that. Yeah, I, I, would echo, I would echo that. I mean, this is very new uh, and, and we are still trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. Um, I mean, at SIBO, we're trying to generate multiple types of incentivization schemes. And so, um, you know, one of them, as I mentioned, is the emissions reduction unit. Um, that is more of an insetting uh, uh, vehicle. And so, you know, we're in that sense, we're able to include any growers that have adopted practices in the past. You know, the look back window goes back at least 10 years um, because what we're doing is change is, is looking at the difference between what their current practices are um, as you know, from the, the, a, a common practice. Uh, baseline uh, within you know that region. So what is typical practice within that particular region? For Vera, we are looking primarily for growers that are adopting practices for the first time. Um, but you know there is we were exploring a, 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 a small look back window potentially to the previous growing season. So a couple of questions came in um, in terms of like soil sampling and very and like specifics around that um, in terms of like maybe acre density or percent of fields that are actually being sampled. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a follow up question. We'll, we'll start with Amanda again here, but hopefully um, each of you can touch on a little bit more specifics on your approach to the sampling and modeling uh, that you use to verify carbon. Sure. So um, not every field in our True Carbon contract program will get a soil sample, but we are taking soil samples that would represent the different types of fields we have. So if one farmer had four fields that were all managed very similarly, similar soil types, we would not sample every field. We'd probably choose one and sample it. So um, we will have a representative sample for each different type of acre that we have, but not every acre gets sampled. And we're taking total soil organic carbon samples as well as bulk density samples so it's not like you know every two acres we take a sample it's one field representative sample and sometimes one sample can represent multiple fields Great. you want to add same order yeah um uh yeah we're also taking uh, so organic carbon and bulk density samples uh, we're actually uh doing our samples on a 50 acre density um, I agree with Amanda that it's not required uh, to take samples uh, in every field, uh, but in the interest of continuing to build uh, data on soil organic carbon, uh, carbon fluxes, uh, we chose to be more granular um, in our approach. Um, basically, uh, we're taking uh, data from Sergo as well as uh, other public data sets um, to look at soil texture, to look at climate, to look at elevation profiles, um, and then stratifying um, the sampling that we're doing uh, based on that baseline information. Yeah, we have a similar approach uh, as well. I mean, I would say that SIBO is a modeling first approach. We use the SALIS model, which is, um, you know, leveraged a, a huge amount of data to develop the model in and of itself. Um, but obviously, you know, to, to validate it and to, uh, as Kurt mentioned, to, to continue to develop bigger data sets that we can use to validate and to, um, uh, you know, push the model further, uh, we are also doing a representative sampling. Um, you know, we'll be checking uh, uh, soil organic carbon and bulk density. Um, and doing so on a representative basis. Um, and so, again, I think there are challenges with uh, with soil sampling. I think, you know, A, it's expensive, and B, it's, it's also less than reliable in some cases. Uh, and so, you know, we really believe in the power of modeling. We think that is the scale, most scalable way to do this, uh, but we also recognize that there's, there's a balance and we need to do some sampling as well. 
Great. So, so this is kind of turning into a third part question, a three part question, because we just kind of uh, teasing out a little bit more. Some questions are coming in before we leave the topic of past practices. Um, can you explain a little bit, you know, like are, are the buyers the same for future and past? Like, like, so kind of who are the buyers or is there a difference and is there a difference between who's, who's interested in those historical uh, credits versus future credits? And we'll start with Amanda again, because I, I, I promise, I promise, Kurt, you're going to get to go first next. Um, <laughs> this question is just kind of evolving here. Yeah, um, so for our first launch, we had one buyer for all of our credits, and it was Microsoft, and they wanted this early delivery of their credits. And so that's why we were able to have this look back period and, and purchase credits for historical years. We do intend to have different buyers. It won't always be Microsoft, um, and we, we hope to have multiple buyers for each season. So depending on buyer um, preferences, whether they want brand new practice adoption or they're willing to do some look back periods, we'll have some variability there for farmers to kind of choose what fits them the best. Great. Yeah, so building on what I said before, um, you know, in, in our supply chain programs, uh, you know, put up uh, Unilever, Tyson and, and Poet there. I mean, those are those organizations are not participating on the buy side of our carbon offsets. A program. So in that case, those are totally different buyers. Um, I think that in some cases in the future, you could see that a buyer would be interested in agribusiness and a combination of insets and offsets. Um, you know, uh, basically uh, working to uh, smooth out the curve if they have uh, emissions pledges that they're trying to mix or trying to meet. Um, you know, incorporating uh, sequestered carbon uh, into their supply chain or emissions reductions, um, and then also purchasing offsets in addition to that. So, I mean, I think in every transaction that you're seeing here, um, the, the, it, the, the structure is a little bit different. Um, but generally, I think, you know, there'll be different buyers on the inset side um, than on the offset side. And in some instances, there'll be a combination of both. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, for past practice adoption, that's primarily going to apply to our emissions reduction unit, which uh, is an insetting scope three vehicle. Um, so primarily the buyers there are going to be those that have a footprint in agriculture uh, and can draw, you know, some some uh, uh, supply chain uh, uh, tr traceability through to agriculture. Um, you know, for new practice adoption, uh, that's also going to include, you know, those same buyers who have a footprint in ag, as well as corporations that are looking to offset their footprints um, through the purchase of offsets. So new practice adoption we see as a broader um, audience, uh, but it's also more difficult to, to you know, generate those credits. So um, move on to kind of a, a, a new topic now. Um, you know, a lot of farmers participate in some sort of state or federal program like EQIP or CSP. And, and again, per the matrix, which I want to just remind people that a lot of basic good information is there. Um, you know, each, each of you indicated that it's possible for farmers to be enrolled in that program as long as they aren't receiving payment for carbon or greenhouse gas. So, so I guess my question is, yes, or am I understanding that correctly? Like essentially there's no double dipping but it's okay if you are a participant in like equip for cost share to establish a practice. Um, so, so yeah, just asking everybody to confirm my understanding is correct. And then also to speak whether, speak to whether your contracts claim all potential ecosystem service credits, you know, like, like, are you looking at habitat biodiversity credits? Are you looking at water quality credits or, or are the contracts agreements you're setting up just carbon? And Kurt, you're up first on this one. Great. Yeah, I mean, just uh, no problem overlapping uh, NRCS programs or other uh, cost share programs uh, with our market. Um, encourage farmers to do so. Um, looking at the price of carbon in the market right now, the cost of, you know, uh, cover crop mix, um, you know, farmers are going to need additional uh, funding um, to adopt these practices and take advantage of these credit opportunities in some cases. So. Um, encourage farmers to participate in those programs. Um, correct, there's no double dipping between uh, our program and another carbon offset program. Um, we're really excited about opportunities uh, with water um, and uh, there would be no problem participating in a water program in addition um, to, to our offset program. Um, and then I think there's also, uh, you know, on the horizon some creative ways uh, to think about 
um, uh, the components of the offset, which are at the end of the day, uh, both emissions reductions and sequestered carbon, um, and potentially having uh, markets that could absorb uh, multiple, uh, one or the other of those uh, pieces of the equation. There. Today, uh, we can't do that. Uh, the carbon offset uh, is a combination of both those things and can't be separated. Um, but uh, I see that being um, uh, in the future. Uh, Sorry about that. My dog is wanting to go in and out. Uh, she may be scratching on the door shortly here. Um, yeah, so you you are able to participate in our program if you're you know leveraging a, a government program as well. The other she is scratching. Sorry. Um, you know, I think that the key is is about the the claims as it relates to the emissions themselves. So if there were a government program that wanted to retire those emissions against their own you know broad national footprint, then there might be some challenges as, as it relates to double counting. Uh, and the same goes uh, to you know overlap with other programs. Once the credit has been sold, uh, you're not able to then sell it elsewhere. Um, but you know we look at this as almost different currencies, right? Carbon is only one of those currencies. Um, you know. Water quality, uh, you know, certification as it relates to the practices, those are different currencies that different types of buyers might be interested in helping incentivize. And as Kurt mentioned, you know, right now uh, the prices of carbon are not high enough on their own to cover the full cost uh, of the practices. And so, you know, we see a lot of value in stacking these incentives, and we're designing our, our platform in a way that allows for that. Amanda, and for us. I would echo a lot of what um, Steve and Kurt both said. So yeah, you can participate in EQIP, CSP, all these other NRCS programs, um, and be participating in True Carbon. Just like the others said, you know, once a credit is sold, it's retired. You can't sell the same season's carbon credit to multiple programs. And we are working through that retailer network and some of our other local conservation partners to develop things like water quality, credit markets, um, biodiversity markets. There's a lot of opportunities out there that we're all exploring, so. Yeah, and I guess um, a, a question, maybe this is specifically for Kurt, because I know you mentioned this during your presentation, the whole kind of biodiversity and the change from um, oats to oats and radish or something like that. So um, what method are you using to estimate the benefits from increased biodiversity? Yeah, so um, that that's incorporated in, in the model uh, that we would use. So it's, it's all based on the baseline, right? So it's, you know, if you just think about, if you just stop thinking about cover crops as cover crops for a second, but you just think about the farmer's rotation and you think about different crops going in, in the ground at different times, um, we're talking about uh, incorporating more crops uh, in the ground over time in a rotation. So, you know, Cover, going from soybeans and corn to soy soy corby, corn and wheat, um, that would be an increase in biodiversity, um, and our models uh, give us the capability to measure uh, the impact of that, of that campaign. Is it is it similar or any other nuances from uh, Steve or Amanda on that? So we're not currently crediting uh, for biodiversity, but we use biodiversity as a mechanism to influence, you know, carbon stocks. Um, so if you're doing a cover crop, then you know that will have an impact. Right now, uh, as it relates to cover, we have a generic cover that we include in our model. Uh, but right now, we're actually building out additional uh, sort of variability within cover crops. So we're building a specific model for clover um, and uh, several others to allow for more precision in terms of our calculations. And for our tool, we are tracking um, kind of the types of cover crops that would be used. So, you know, rye versus a rye and other blend or legumes. So we are tracking that in the tool. And one of the outcomes that we're measuring is a soil quality index. So we do have some pieces built into the Trutera Insights engine to kind of track that biodiversity and the effect on your farm. Great. Um, so, um, Shifting now and just kind of looking at the platforms that you all offer, um, we'll start with Steve and just uh, hoping to learn a little bit more about what kind of free and or fee-based services your platform provides. And, it, and if a farmer wanted to sign up to use your data platform, how much does it cost them? 
So it doesn't cost anything. Um, you know, SIBO's platform is, is public facing. So you, know, you can go to SIBOtechnologies.com uh, today and play around with our map and, you know, look at an individual parcel to get additional insights about, you know, from our, our land and IQ platform to really understand, you know, what's happening on the ground. We also show information about, you know, what types of management practices that we're identifying using our remote vision in the past. Um, you also have the ability as a grower to, you know, test uh, your enrollment to understand how much credit you'd be able to generate, um, you know, through an enrollment of, of a particular field. And so that's going to, you know, again, instantaneously, instantaneously run our model uh, in before you've ever actually enrolled the land. And we're continuing to build out more tools in this regard uh, that allow you to go and test different scenarios, right? So you could run a scenario of a particular set of management practices in the past uh, as it compared to, you know, different management practices in the future. Um, so we want to make this as flexible as possible and give as much value as we can to growers up front. Now, we also have an enterprise platform that allows you to go in, um, and you know, uh, enroll a, a large number of field boundaries uh, to understand your overall impact across you know entire set of fields. Um, and then you know, I think I showed this in some of my screenshots. You're also able very easily from there to enroll land in our carbon market um, after you've understood a little bit more about what the potential impact looks like. Amanda. Yeah. So TrueTerra Insights Engine is available through our retailer network. And that would help farmers dig deeper on a field by field basis on their operation. Um, you can put in kind of all your field management information for each season that you wanted to and get insights out of it. So our retailer network offers that to farmers. Um, for True Carbon, farmers could work directly with TrueTerra, but you don't get all the other field insights that you get through our retailers that offer TrueTerra. And because they're different retailers, they all market them a little bit market the program a little bit differently. Some of them may have a fee for participation. Um, and sometimes that varies based on kind of the level of support and, and how much information you get back out of it from that retailer. So it, it can vary. Okay. Yeah, so um, FBN historically has been a, a yearly membership, um, but in uh, the fall of uh, 2020, uh, we made the membership free. Um, and so you can access all of the analytics um, that we use for our gradable carbon program uh, through your FBN account uh, for free. Um, and yeah, uh, if you go to FBN.com, you can create an account uh, today. That gives you access to uh, you know, gradable services uh, as well as um, other opportunities um, through the FBN network. So um, no cost uh, to join gradable carbon. Again, we're covering the cost of soil sampling and verification. Um, and so a uh, no upfront cost to participate. Um, you know, we do have that gradable plan offering uh, for farmers that are more interested um, in getting specific recommendations from an agronomist um, to, again, balance the goals of, say, a carbon program um, with uh, you know, yield goals, uh, production goals, incorporating practices, all of that. Um, and that starts at 450 uh, an acre to participate um, uh, in that. Um, so, yeah. So that kind of, uh, Kurt, you kind of set up my follow-up question pretty well because um, I was kind of curious, like what, what, like what, what's the value to a grower who maybe just wants this information but never intends to enroll in some sort of market program? You know, so like, like of your fee-based service or whether it's free, how much is geared towards supporting the adoption of soil health practices? You know, be it like through technical or agronomic support. Um, and maybe, maybe this is just really brief, like, is that an option? Does your platform provide that? And, and if so, you know, is that the paid version? Um, and so I think we'll go back to Steve to start kind of this follow up round. Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, we have an enterprise uh, platform that's designed to, you know, that's almost like an interface with growers. Um, many of them have a grower network that they're working with and they're looking to sort of visualize the overall, uh, you know, sort of field portfolio within our system. And so oftentimes our, our partners are going to be providing agronomic support. We as SIBO don't directly do that. We either do it through our enterprises or through, um, you know, third parties that, that we've worked with to actually go on, on site and help uh, uh, provide advice in that regard. Um, you know, growers do have the ability to go into our platform and, and again, run the model essentially against their own land uh, to understand what the carbon footprint would look like um, or the reductions might look like with a change in management practices. But we're not offering specific advice on the best uh, you know, pathways to do that outside of you know, showing the impact of what those results look like. Okay. Uh, Amanda? 
Yep. So our program, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, we've been working on on-farm stewardship and conservation since before 2016. So that has been, before these eco markets came about, um, that has been what we've been doing through our retailer network. So those retailers definitely provide kind of guidance and advice on which practices a farmer might look at that would make sense for their farm from an agronomic and production aspect, as well as protecting natural resources. That's been our focus for a handful of years. Thanks. Kurt? Yeah, so um, the FBN platform analytics uh, um, uh, system that we have, I mean, there's no tiered pricing for that. You get everything as a grower um, from day one. Um, um, I, just to add to the conversation a little bit, I think like what we're talking about here is sort of uh, a shift a little bit towards ROI based thinking and balancing, you know, these ecosystem services markets with yield imperatives, you know, with, with the price of commodities right now, I don't think any farmer is going to sacrifice yield nor would that necessarily be beneficial for uh, carbon offset generation. Um, but I do think that there's, uh, you know, a, a balance of thinking about what are the best long-term solutions for the farm and these practices are continuing to get a spotlight year after year. Farmers are starting to think a lot more about soil health and taking data from their soil to drive their decisions. Um, so I think that that's where we're going. Um, for us, uh, our agronomy offering through Gradable Plan um, directly uh, uh, targets uh, the type of farmer that wants to do that. Um, but Farmers have independent agronomists. They work through their local co-op and get recommendations there. So there's a variety of ways that farmers are gonna go about thinking about practice adoption and participation in these platforms. Um, but a shift towards ROI-based thinking and balancing you know, multiple ways of earning premiums um, is, is where we're going uh, as, as gradable. So I think one thing that I've learned through all these discussions really is like data, I think might be the most critical piece in making these markets work, you know? So um, I'm kind of curious, there was, a, there was a number of questions we got through registration and even through today. What control does a producer have over their data? You know, and, and what actually happens to their data? You know, they, they, they play in the gradable sandbox for a little bit and then they go over to SIBO. What, what happens to their data as they leave your platform? And I think we are back on Amanda going first on this one. Yeah, um, if a, so first of all, data privacy has been very important to TrueTerra since we built our tool. Um, we have some agreements in place that very clearly outline to a farmer, this is what your data will be used for, these are the types of people that we might share it with, and really that comes down to people helping us facilitate this carbon offer. Um, if a farmer is not to participate in our program or our platform in the future, their historical data would be stored. But again, it's not shared beyond anyone that they've authorized it to be shared with. Um, and then even if they requested it, it could get removed from the system. Um, for carbon, I'm not sure we can totally remove it because they've agreed to that data stored for a carbon asset. But. Kurt? Um, yeah, so we also have uh, a privacy policy, data security policy, which you can access uh, on our website, uh, the gradable privacy policy. Um, you know, since the start of FBN, we've known that uh, farmer data is very valuable and it's really important uh, to keep that information anonymous, de-identified um, in every opportunity, if not all the time. In the case of uh, carbon offset markets, we do have to share information with um, verifiers. Um, uh, about uh, the practices that are happening, but it doesn't go beyond that. And we have a data agreement with verifiers as well to make sure uh, that is exclusively used um, by those organizations. But, um, you know, thinking about uh, supply chain programs as well, and, you know, a grain buyer looking at their scope three emissions, right, the actual emissions associated with the grain they're purchasing, that's another example where we need a moat around the farmer data. It's really important that that information um, does not flow into uh, a local grain buyer. And so that's a key component of our, of our inset programs as well, um, is that information not passed at the end of the grade. Great. And Steve? 
Yeah, so we, we have uh, very similar uh, data sharing agreements uh, and privacy agreements. You know, we're, we're not, if, if a, a grower decided to leave our program, their data would neither be shared nor used for any other purpose. Um, you know, and to the extent that we're acquiring data from other providers and, and you know, to facilitate our programs or to share it elsewhere to facilitate the programs, would we, we would first need um, you know, permission from the grower. So we're very careful to ensure that uh, a grower's privacy is respected and that their data remains their own. Great. So um, I, I see we're, we're almost out of time. I have time for just one more question and um, just, again, remind the audience to refer to that program matrix for some other basic information. And we'll have um, company websites coming up here. So but my last question, really, and I think we're at Kurt starting this one off. Um, what closing remarks do you have for the audience? And, and what I'd like you to do is approach this as if you're speaking to you know aunt jenny and uncle joe who happen to be farmers and and they want your advice on what they should be considering or doing given given this whole market space so um this is personal and um we're just kind of thinking about all the considerations that farmers should be thinking about um, what advice would you give them and kurt yeah um i think that uh you know my my presentation initially summarized this in the beginning but there's a lot of activity in this space right now. There's a lot of opportunities for farmers. It's a very um, uh, exciting time. Um, and um, carbon offsets are one piece of a, of a changing landscape that's rewarding sustainable practices and ecosystem services. So um, if I was a farmer today, um, I would be uh, watching everything that's happening in this space, looking for opportunities where uh, they can participate in the upside um, in the market um, where they can experiment. Um, I would be definitely looking at contracts in the space um, and, and participating in a contract that is farmer friendly, that doesn't lock you in um, for uh, one program for a long time um, because uh, things are very dynamic right now. Um, so, uh, you know, this series is a great opportunity for farmers to learn um, about all these different programs and opportunities in the space. And I would just say that it's going to be a multi year learning experience. Uh, for farmers here, um, and they should just continue to read as much as they can and stay educated about the opportunities um, so that they can, uh, you know, participate in a program that's that's right for their farm business. Great. Thanks. How about you, Steve? Yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of what Kurt just said. I think, you know, there's so many entrants into the space and there's so much interest and in, in hype around carbon markets. Um, you know, if you're thinking about uh, adopting some of these practices, I would, you know, First, look and see what sort of an impact you might be able to have, right? I, I would uh, before jumping in and you know adopting no-till and spending a huge amount of upfront uh, uh, resources on equipment and seed for cover crop, uh, you know, go to SIBO's platform and check out to see you know what that impact might look like. How much could you actually earn? Um, and as Kurt mentioned, I would be careful about signing long-term contracts. There are programs that require, you know, a 10-year commitment uh, with some teeth uh, associated with it. Uh, that's really why, you know, SIBO's worked on building an annual program that doesn't lock you in long-term. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's you, you should be very careful about making long-term commitments um, and come check out SIBO to, to understand a little bit more about what, uh, your, plat what your land is capable of. Great. Have, and I think, Amanda, you get the last word here then. Yeah, um, I if it, I tell my family, my my dad, my father-in-law, not everybody has to adopt the same practices. Not everybody has to do this, but I do think it is worth taking the time to take a hard look at your farm beyond just your yield goals and how much money you're making per acre. What's the effect of your current operation on things like soil health, erosion? Find practices that fit for your farm and work for what you want to do and the improvements you want to see on your land over time. And there's going to be a program that's going to fit that. There's so many program options out there. So find things that fit your farm and then find a program that fits that. Don't change practices because you want to get this person's payment and qualify for their program. Well, great. Great advice from all three of you. And I really appreciate all of you for taking time today and share information with us. Um, I will ask Megan to pull up the slide deck and um, see if we will do some quick wrap up here. Um, when this closes out, um, there will be a survey window that pops up and we ask everybody to just take that survey. Um, and and I, guess, I guess also a teaser for anyone who's looking for CEUs, now is the time to get your phone out because we're gonna have that QR code on the next slide. But um, 
for everyone else, um, there are some websites listed here, follow up that um, were provided by our presenters as an opportunity to go explore a little bit more, reach out to them. And, um, and then also that survey I mentioned, your feedback is really helpful. This is two of four that we're doing. So any uh, suggestions that you offer to us will be helpful as we um, prepare for the next two sessions in July. Um, and then we invite you to visit ISAP's website for the matrix, the resource document that we touched on for today, um, and the video recording of this event, as well as video recordings of Tuesday's event, and eventually when we get in July, everything's going to be on illsustainableag.org slash ecomarket. So you're going to want to check that out regularly. We're going to continue using that URL throughout the series. Um, and then tomorrow, Friday, you'll receive a follow-up email from GoToWebinar with some uh, links and information as well. <clears throat> Each, okay, so here's the QR code for those uh, people seeking CEUs. Each session has been approved for one and a half hours in soil and water management. So if you have the app, you can scan your QR code and claim your credits using that. And if you don't have the CCA app, you can request credits using a form that is linked at our website um, and also will be followed or included in that follow-up email. So again, just make sure you're on the right date. Um, there's a box for June 22 and a box for June 24 different forms there. Um, and so you can do that and uh, we will take care of submitting your CCA numbers for credits. And uh, lastly, just, you know, we'll be continuing this conversation in July and we'll be mixing it up a little bit by looking at bigger picture market opportunities. Um, on July 13th, we'll be joined by Cargill, General Mills and PepsiCo. Um, and then July 15th, we're going to be looking beyond carbon at water quality and other potential revenue streams for ecosystem services. And um, we'll also have a pan, um, one of the panelists will be a farmer who's been working in this space for a long time. So it should be a really good conversation. And I hope you'll join us for that. And you're already registered for those webinars. Um, the only thing you need to do is just double check your calendar to be sure that you've set aside the time 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on July 13th and 15th, and look for those email reminders that will come to you as those dates approach. So thank you again for joining us. I hope you found today's discussion informative, and I wish you all a safe and productive afternoon.